I want to start talking with some of you about your personal experiences coming out as gay or lesbian or transgendered. And I'd like to start with you, Jessica. Could you talk a little bit about how you came out to your parents a few years ago and what happened? I came out when I was 17 in my senior year. Well, my parents didn't accept of it, um, so they kicked me out. I was couch serving, house hopping, going in between shelters. Um, I've actually stayed with a couple of my teachers at my high school at that time, so I did graduate, which is another problem if for LGBT youth if they are kicked out when they're still in high school. They don't have the resources to finish school or place to stay, and mainly the high school diploma is what really they need. Now you told your parents you were gay, right? But you're in fact you're transgendered. I'm in the very early process of transitioning, yes. Okay. Why did you decide that it would be safer to tell them you were gay? Just the general population is, I would say, a lot, not a lot more accepting, but maybe a little bit more understanding between gay and lesbian and transgender, where they don't know what to do, like, what are you? How, how did you know that you were transgendered? How did you know if you were straight or if you were a boy or a girl? Like, it was just like, I knew I was a girl in a boy's body. I was playing with dolls, my sister's clothes, trying to watch girly shows when I was little. My mom was just sick of it or yell at me. Or It was hard for both of us because I can under, kind of understand their point, but it's still like, I'm, I'm your child. So I, I'm, the way I felt it was kind of more like conditional love. How do things stand with them now? It's just complicated. I can't be myself around them, and if I try to like talk to them about it, anything in kind of like my personal life that I find interesting, they'll just kind of shut it out or get angry or upset, or the whole day gets ruined, pretty much. You told them and they just opened the door and said, see ya? They said pretty much pack my bags and go. They're like, if you want to live like this, you can't be here at all. Wow. I want to go to Kayla. Uh, you knew for a long time that you were gay, but you kind of did the normal high school things. You know, went yeah. to prom, dated. dated Why? I was a uh, prom princess. Like. You were prom princess. <laughs> <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> um, it was something that was never allowed in my house. We were told from a very young age that we had to, if we were ever to tell my parents that we were anything other than straight, that we'd be kicked out, similar situation. It was just something that was definitely not accepted. I was raised very Catholic, very Chicana. Um, and so I even remember when I was little saying, oh my gosh, I hope I never end up like what they talk about because I thought to me it was like a disease or a demon possession or something that was so terrible that you never wanna get. And so growing up, if I wanted to stay in my house, even after I started questioning it, I had to continue to just do what my family wanted me to do. So you waited until you graduated and went to college. Mm -hmm. How did they take it once you told them? Now they're still in denial. They still, it's not something that we just don't talk about. Have they started asking when you're gonna get married? Oh yeah. I, <laughs> <laughs> um, my mom always, you'll break my heart if you don't get married, if you don't give me grandchildren. Someday you have to get married. She tells me about all these great guys at her work that she could give me their numbers or try and arrange something, but it just doesn't. It's something that I don't think they'll ever understand. And I, for a long time, I hated that. And I was like, why is it so hard for them to understand? But they know no different. Do you, do you feel like you can stay in touch with your culture? That's one thing that I, I really struggled with because I love my culture. I, I'm very passionate about the fact that I'm Chicana. I even spell it with an X. <laughs> I'm very passionate about that. But things like Catholicism and all of that, like I was confirmed Catholic, but even when I would go to confirmation, we had classes on homosexuality leads to hell. How do you feel now about your life versus how you felt in high school? I feel much more confident. Back in high school, I was um, very scared. I got to a point where I... You were scared someone would find out. Mm -hmm. And I, I hated myself. I honestly was, it, the coming out process wasn't something that was like rainbows and flowers and butterflies and all kinds of things. It was a big 
period of self-hatred and I even contemplated taking my own life at one point because I felt that there, there must have been a demon in me. There must have been something wrong with me like I had been told my whole life. And so I was in a very dark place in high school. And so going to college, becoming self-sufficient, getting a place to live and being able to be myself. And at UNM, I really felt like they provided a place with like the center and things like that that really helped people to feel more comfortable coming into their skin and who they really are. Tatiana, you began the process of transitioning and you're from the Navajo Nation, right? Yes. And you grew up in Cuba? Yes. So before you transitioned though, you knew that you were a woman. Well, like I knew from a younger age, you know, who I was and I, um, I self-identified when I was younger, but I kept it to myself. I still was very feminine. I was still very flamboyant at that time because, and then like when I entered high school, I, you know, just came out to my friends and everybody and my mom, you know, as a gay male. I didn't really have much of bullying. I have had a few name calling, but you know, I confronted people, you know, I'm like, you know, what you say is not gonna hurt me, you know, I am who I am and you know, you're not gonna do anything about it. So after that, like everybody just kind of realized, you know, just, you know, it's whatever, leave it alone. After I had graduated, I moved to Albuquerque. I did start wearing more feminine clothes out here. Um, I was being more open with who I was. And in 2009, my father had passed, and I kind of thought of it as an outlet to be who I really wanted to be. So I moved home, and that's where I actually started the whole process of transitioning. Um, hormone therapy, and I did it all with my family. I let them grow to grow with me. Were they accepting? My family was very accepting, and especially my grandmothers. I love my grandmothers to death because they were always there, hmm. always encouraging. And like I could go to church anywhere out there and no one would come against me or <laughs> say something was wrong with me. Now, Lily, uh, your mom actually asked you to be gay before you came out. <laughs> the moment I hit puberty, yeah. Um, was that a surprise to you? You know, I, I don't even really remember at the time if, if it was surprising or if it was really even something I thought about. Um, it's just kind of like, I, I, don't, I don't think so. Mom, boys are cute. And, and they are. I still think, you know, boys are cute, people are cute. But um, mom was like, oh, let's wait and see. I'm pretty sure, pretty sure you're a lesbian. And I was like... Okay, well, <laughs> I guess we'll wait and see. Did you feel you pressured know? to be a lesbian? If <laughs> no. Oh, okay. No, I didn't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, my mother and I have a really fantastic relationship, so I never felt like I had to be one thing or another thing. Um, but it was definitely interesting. It was not really something I'd thought about um, at that time, and, and it became something I thought about, and I didn't have to come out when I realized, you know, I was really really fortunate, really lucky and privileged in my experience coming out um, as queer. I came out really young too. Mm -hmm. I came out at 12 years old, so uh, you know, for the first time, um, we all come out like on a daily basis if, if, you know, not multiple times a day. So the first time I came out was when I was 12. You mean as you get to know other people and... Yeah, you know, every okay. time you meet somebody, every time you have to tell somebody where you work or what you do or, you know, what you care about or who you're dating or no, I don't think that person's cute because I'm not attracted to people of that gender or sex. Um, you know, it, it, it's a coming out experience all the time. Mm -hmm. Lois, I wanted to turn to you because you're a mom. Sure am. With a gay son. I sure am. And he's 29 now. He is. But he had a really tough time. He Brian, was bullied and... Uh, very much so. Brian knew he was different when he was three years old and we're learning that more and more. That kids know when they're little, that they're different, and they've got to process it. And a lot of people don't understand what goes on inside that individual. Brian found out about PFLAG, and when he came home from PFLAG, it was like he was a different kid. I just felt the enlightenment, enlightenedness in him. And I've since realized, you know, by going to PFLAG and being accepted there, and Brian knew he was okay for being who he was. but. There was a group of boys that uh, harassed him, and Brian was coming home from uh, Real Rancho 
uh, one day, and he's, and he's old Suzuki, and he drove by, and he happened to notice this kid out in the yard. Well, it was the kid that had been harassing him. And Brian said, Mom, I just rolled my window down and I screamed. I know now that feeling he had inside of him, the anger, the hurt that he experienced when he saw that kid. And anyway, come on home. The kid jumped in his car and followed Brian. We live out on the West Mesa and our front door faces the Mesa up there. Instead of Brian turning and coming into our yard, he went out on the Mesa. And uh, luckily enough, the kid that was chasing him got stuck in the sand out there. And Brian came home. And he told me, he says, wow. He says, I'm lucky he got stuck. And then he shared with me what happened. I said, my God, son, you should never have gone out on the Mesa. What if he would have caught you? He says, Mom, I didn't want you to see if he killed me, if that would have happened. How did you live through all this as a mom? You just do. You just do. And uh, to the support of PFLAG and other parents and kids that struggle, your story, your story. Um, you're not alone in what you're dealing with. I had never heard of cutting until Brian. Brian attempted his life once in Los Alamos, and that's where he started cutting, and he carries the scars on his arms from cutting. But I understand now that why kids cut themselves. Because they're in pain. Yes, because they're in pain. How is he now? He's phenomenal. He's phenomenal. He graduated from UNM, and he's an interpreter for the deaf. And this young lady, and I've had other people ask, well, why did he choose interpreting? Because I had other ideas of what he should be. Most moms do. <laughs> yeah, they do. They do. But I said, son, uh, why did you choose interpreting? I didn't know whether it would be able to provide him an income to, you know, for his livelihood. And he says, Mom, I want to help people. And that's who he is. He's a very caring, giving young man. And uh, always, a lot of what these kids go through, they're bitter, they move on. But words hurt too. They're deep scars that they have to live with. I want to turn to some of our advocates here. We've heard these are really different stories. So what is it, what are the biggest things facing LGBT youth here that you're working on, Cynthia? We um, are starting, are hoping to start a, a shelter for gay and, and lesbian teens here in New Mexico because we have such an extreme need. Jessica's story, unfortunately, is not unusual. And we have lots of kids like Jessica, but kids that don't do as well as Jessica. You know, the fact that you were able to graduate and get a job and start taking care of yourself is amazing. Most kids have to drop out. Most kids just need to find a place to stay every night um, when they're kicked out of their homes. Even, um, you know, on a nightly basis, there are tons of kids that are homeless in New Mexico just in general, much less gay and lesbian kids. So, um, you know, New Mexico has the third highest population of homeless in the nation. Uh, those numbers are rising every day. The jobless rates are rising every day, and um, you know our kids are at risk for um, much higher rates of suicide, much higher rates of addiction, must, much higher rates of self-harming behaviors. Um, and so, you know, we just we we need our kids to just live, you know, and just have the basic needs covered. We um, we don't have enough homeless shelters in the state altogether, much less mm -hmm. for gay and lesbian kids. It's really hard to go into a shelter setting. Um, when most of the time the rules are girls on this side, boys on this side, no fraternization. You know, where do, where do our kids go when they go to those shelters? Sometimes kids are having to sleep on a couch in a common room because they don't fit in with the boy's side or the girl's side, or they're not comfortable themselves being on the boy's side and the girl's side. Adrian, you opened the Transgendered Resource Center a year ago, two years ago? We've been around for about four years, but oh, we, four opened, years. I'm sorry. we opened our space in February. So uh, one thing, she just brought up. In some ways, society's getting more comfortable with gay and lesbian, not totally, but the issue of the gender issue of like where they, people can't figure out, quote unquote, what you are, or where you fit, that seems to be really threatening and puts people at extra risk. It really in our does. Society. It absolutely does. I mean, I think even, you know, 
we even forget to say transgender to think about transgender people when we say you know LGBT. We it's a uh, you know in the transgender communities we talk about the T being silent mm -hmm. a lot of the time because we feel either uh, you know not considered at all or, or tokenized you know only considered in a token sort of way. And really, it's so easy to do accommodations in shelters. There's a brilliant document out on the internet right now called Transitioning Our Shelters. You can Google it. And it's got some just very down-to-earth recommendations on how to deal with accommodating trans people in shelter situations without doing any kind of build-out or retrofitting to the facility. It's very possible to logistically work with trans folks if you just have the willingness to do so. Is it just a matter of education? Absolutely. I think that's a huge part of it. We talked about some of the, the things that Brian went through and some of you have gone through. And I know, Jen, you and Ashley have both worked with Gay Straight Alliances. I mean, is this one way to, to address things like this? Absolutely. I think it starts a lot with education and helping, you know, whether we're looking in the schools and we're, you know, helping the young people educate their peers. And we, you know, probably most of you all who have been in school in the last five or ten years have heard, you know, people saying, oh, that's so gay. Or, oh, come on, don't be such a fag. And the, the young people saying those things, they may not be trying to say that's so homosexual when they're talking about something that's not cool, but that's what it connects to, that's what it relates to. And so just stopping that language and, and, and interrupting that behavior and doing just a little bit of education in the moment about how hurtful that can be. And so that's just a simple way that really anybody, whether a parent or an educator or community member, can interrupt that. Um, in the high schools and some middle schools and even across the nation, some elementary levels, Gay Straight Alliance Clubs or GSAs are becoming uh, more and more prevalent throughout the years. Are they the generally years. only in high schools here in New uh, Mexico? No, in New Mexico okay. they're predominantly in high schools, yeah. but we do have several middle schools, um, especially in Albuquerque and Santa Fe, that have started Gay Straight Alliance Clubs. Um, and sometimes even in the elementary school it's more of a support club. Um, and if you even look at how our families are changing, you know, this is for kids who identify as LGBT or straight allies. And a, a young person who's a straight ally, they may have friends, they just may believe in, you know, human dignity and equality. They may have parents of the same gender. You know, they may have two moms or two dads or a mom who's a lesbian or a dad who's gay. So it's really for all of our youth and to make youth a safer place for all of our youth. And it's really grown even in New Mexico. In 2005, there's only about 12 GSAs um, that the New Mexico Gistra Alliance Network of the Mountain Center knew of, and now we have over 57 and oh, counting. Great. Um, That's great. Ashley, you were involved in a Gay Straight Alliance here in Albuquerque, right? Yep. Why did you want to get involved with this in high school? My very best friend, we used to kind of joke around with him, like, "That's so gay." And one day, it was back in the MySpace days, and I, I clicked on his MySpace profile, and it said he was gay. And I was like, "Ben, are you?" you know your, your MySpace says that you're gay, right? And he was like, well, I have to tell you something. And he came out to me. It was like I completely, my world flipped over. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry for like making fun of you. I didn't know this was a real thing. And then we got to high school and he had a couple kids that um, bullied him a lot never physically, only verbally, but uh, it was taking a toll on him. And I said, well, you know, there's a Gay Street Alliance club. Why don't you go to this club? And he just didn't want to. And I was like, okay, we're going. Do you think it's effective when, when straight people or speak up with people who are LGBTQ? Oh, definitely. Okay. I mean, because I was in a leadership role in other parts of the school, they saw that I was straight and I was standing up for my friend, so we started hearing a lot less of that so gay. And it, it has a big, big effect. Alma Rosa, you um, and Lily and Kayla are involved with the LGBT Resource Center at UNM. Is, you also, you help in put safe zones around the campus and work with <coughs> schools to create safe zones. Is that sort of a similar idea to make everyone accountable? or It's actually it kind of goes along the lines of what was just being said around <clears throat> straight allies and having space. The LGBTQ Resource Center was started by a student movement 
at UNM, so it was the students that said they wanted, <clears throat> they wanted visibility, they wanted to be seen, they wanted resources at UNM, and then they rose up and they demanded a resource center. And so the student governing body, which uh, Kayla sits on now, they did fund the resource center the first year. And so it's been my charge to continue to integrate the resource center um, throughout the entire university community, as well as help build visibility off campus as well. And one of the things that we have done are uh, we provide the safe zone trainings. We are um, not in a centrally located area on campus so we felt that it was critical for us to create safe spaces around campus so that if anybody questioning someone's an ally, a straight ally, or that has come out or is transgender or is transitioning has a place to feel safe even if it's oh my goodness, I'm crushing on someone for the first time ever and I want to share this great news with somebody. And there's a safe zone because it's identified by a sticker um, and a rainbow and a UNM paw that you can go in there and have someone that understands your community. That could be a teacher, that could be a staff person. It can be person. anybody, a faculty, staff, okay. um, anyone at UNM uh, really can be safe zone trained. And so we are providing those spaces around campus, not just for visibility, but we really are trying to shift a culture at UNM and hopefully that that will spill out into the greater community. So what are some of the top things we need to do now to make things better for kids in New Mexico, for youth in New Mexico, LGBTQ youth? I wanted to mention there's also <clears throat> there's the Dan Savage campaign of It Gets Better where there are people, you know, uh, mostly adults are sharing that you know, after high school, it gets better. But there was also the youth movement created a, another movement to go in conjunction with that called Make It Better, um, which is saying, well, you know, you don't have to just wait for it to get better. You can make it better now. And how do you do that? Um, whatever ways that youth think is possible, the youth-driven campaign. So with the New Mexico GSA network, young people every year, they learn about the political process and then they go to the legislators and they advocate for legislation, for policies, for whatever they feel is important to protect you know, themselves as LGBTQ and straight allied young people, as well as just young people in general. So you know, just because a young person's not 18, it doesn't mean they can't advocate to their legislators. And as community members, we can all go um, to our legislators. We can go to our, you know, the schools that our children go to. We can, you know, as a community member, just go to our school districts, our school boards, our local nonprofits. We can ask for forms to be changed to say parent one, parent two, instead of saying mother, father, making a you know, heteronormative assumption there. So, you know, those are some ways that community members in general can affect change uh, in their small circles as well as a larger sphere of influence. Okay. All right, well, we'll talk more about this in the next section. We have a senator and Peter from the ACLU. So keep thinking about that question.